Thanks a lot for the invitation. And when it's an occasion for Sergio, then the, what else can you talk about but the Vicati equation? <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, it arises in many contexts. And we had a very nice session, actually, a history session at the IFAC Congress. And uh, so I'm going to talk about, I mean, those of you who know my past work and from the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, I made a connection between robust control and, and games. And, and that will be the main theme. And, uh, but there is a bit more. And, uh, and some of the, I just heard from the uh, director of this center here that the complexity is an important sort of topic that is being uh, studied through the summer schools this year. And, and there is an element of complexity here. And I'll uh, tell you how uh, it's resolved. And so it, it uh, leads to some current research interest, which is being pursued in different uh, fields. Uh, both control and game theory, as well as uh, 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 mathematics and partial differential equations, and so on. So, so here is my uh, starting point. Uh, so we have a stochastic uh, linear quadratic zero-sum differential games, and stochastic because there is a, a, a W, a Wiener process, uh, capital W. And uh, so there are two types of inputs. There is the control input, and there is an adversarial input or unknown input, W. If you don't have the, uh, the Wiener process uh, input, then, then this is a standard framework for without the expectation, of course, in that case, of H infinity optimal control. But uh, what I want to talk about, uh, especially in the, as a, as a follow-up to this, uh, will involve the stochastic input. So therefore, I plugged it, this in, and it doesn't change the nature of the solution, at least here. So, so we know that for the uh, uh, standard robust control problem with uh, uh, both state feedback as well as output feedback, but I'm going to stay with state feedback here, then you introduce a, a, a sort of a soft constraint uh, on W, on the disturbance unknown disturbance and, and uh, view this as a game between the controller and the disturbance W. And, and you look for a saddle point solution. And if you want to interpret it into for H infinity optimal control, you are actually looking for the smallest possible values of gamma. And that's the disturbance, optimum disturbance attenuation value, smallest value of gamma such that this uh, cost, when it is minimized by u and maximized by w, uh, is going to be finite. In other words, the w will not be able to drive it to infinity. So the state feedback solution, naturally, and, and we all know this, uh, involves a, a Riccati differential equation. If you have the infinite time horizon, and if I take the average cost here, because of the Wiener process, otherwise this is not uh, finite, then you have the algebraic version of this under uh, controllability, observability conditions. So for the finite, I'll stay for the finite with the finite horizon here. So, so the, what's different from the standard Riccati equation is that there is this negative term here. And because of this negative term, if you take gamma to be sufficiently small but positive, then, the, then there is going to be a finite escape here. So within a finite interval, the Riccati equation being a quadratic equation uh, escapes to infinity. And this is known as the conjugate point. So, so we're looking uh, in this uh, context, uh, the smallest value of gamma uh, such that this doesn't happen. So that's, that's gamma star. So for all gamma larger than gamma star, then, then there will be a solution to this. And that's the, the, your robust controller. You design a z corresponding to this value of gamma, slightly larger than gamma star, and this is the best you can do, and, and you are robustifying it against this, this uh, disturbance. Now, uh, the second uh, problem I want to uh, formulate is the so-called risk sensitive, and the two are related, the risk sensitive linear quadratic uh, 
uh, zero-sum stochastic differential games. So what I'm going to do is uh, uh, have the same uh, state equation. Again, the, the U is the control, W is the disturbance, which is a deterministic disturbance. And this is an, an, uh, a stochastic input into the system, again, a winner process. But now, instead of having this cost function, uh, which was neutral, was neutral on the previous slide, I'm going to exponentiate it after multiplying it by delta over two. And this is known by the risk sensitive optimal control. And, uh, and, and this is a generalization of risk sensitive optimal control. It's a zero sum uh, game. So, so risk sensitivity when delta is positive brings in an element of robustness and, uh, and you can solve for the saddle point. Again, you can formulate this as a problem uh, in, in uh, zero-sum stochastic differential games. And you look for a state feedback control U and a state feedback uh, disturbance W such that this is min-maxed. And, and uh, now you have two parameters here. Now, in addition to a gamma, you also have a delta. And, uh, and then the solution to this, again, is unique whenever it exists. And, but this time you have two parameters, gamma and delta. So you have to look at the region in the plane uh, of gamma and delta. Outside uh, some bounded region, then the state feedback saddle point strategies exist. And, and, and inside that region, then you have infinite. So, so the, uh, these two parameters, either, uh, note that the delta again enters uh, as a negative term here. Now, a special case would be uh, when d is equal to zero or gamma goes to infinity, then this term drops out. And as you can see, this is a, if I pick e to be equal to d, then this is exactly the same form as the, as the previous equation. Okay, so as, the, as uh, this one where I have d, d transpose. So, so there is an equivalence between the risk sensitive uh, uh, stochastic control problem without the W element here, uh, and uh, the original uh, 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 risk neutral problem where you have a W, a disturbance. So, so, uh, so there is a, that equivalence, but this provides a much more general sort of, and there are two elements of uh, uh, uncertainty that comes in, or adversarial actions, and gamma and delta, and they could be controlled by the same uh, in other words, the, the, uh, the presence of delta brings in a fictitious additional disturbance into the system and, or an adversarial action, which is responsible for this term. And, and so whatever uh, 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 theory you have for the original Riccati equation that I had on the, on the first slide with just the DD transpose term, you also can analyze it in exactly the same way when you have this additional term. <laughs> And particularly if E is equal to D, then these two are, are added together. And so therefore this plane, this, this region of existence of a solution boils down to a, a single sort of a, a, a one, -dimensional, one dimensional line. Okay, and as delta goes to infinity, the solution converges to the risk neutral case as I indicated earlier. Now, uh, the, uh, the main purpose here uh, is, is to look into non-zero-sum uh, stochastic differential games. So you have uh, each, uh, you have more than one player, more than one controller, more than one decision maker, if you uh, like, and, and then there is again a stochastic input. And, and what we are interested in, each decision maker, or we call it an agent or a player, uh, controls, uh, has a, has a possibly different cost function. And again, this is a, a, a quadratic cost function because we are interested in uh, coming up with Riccati equations. The feedback Nash equilibrium solution, whenever it exists, is, is uh, uh, linear and, and, uh, and is in this form. And, and there is a Z sub i here, which is like the Riccati equation. But now you have coupled Riccati equations because of the coupling between the the players. So, uh, so this coupled Riccati equation, you can see that uh, uh, there is the, when j equals to i, 
here, then, then you have the quadratic term, which is the natural thing, and, uh, and then you also have cross terms between J and I. And, uh, uh, and this, is the, this is the closed loop. Uh, now you can also formulate the sensitive version of this. I'm not, I don't have expressions uh, on that here because I want to discuss one other point. Uh, and, uh, uh, but there's no clean set of results of existence and uniqueness, both for this case as well as for the sensitive case. Okay? And, and uh, the, the other thing I want to point out is that normally it would be natural for uh, different agents, different players, to have their own system dynamics. For example, you can, you can uh, break this into, uh, if there are n players, into n components. Each one, each one could be vector valued, like x1 through xn. And each player is controlling its own dynamics. And maybe there will be some input from the other players as well. But, but it's very natural, especially if you have a very large system, for each control uh, to be a function of only the local state and not, not of the, the entire state because that's not scalable. And, uh, and this, uh, uh, when each player has access to only local state information, even the characterization of the solution is not known. Uh, leaving aside the existence and uniqueness because there is this problem of, of infinite uh, second guessing by the players if they don't have access to the states of the other players, but the, those states affect the state dynamics of that particular player. So the question is, uh, uh, how can we address this problem? And, and this is what I want to talk about for the remaining time. Uh, so particularly, is there any hope for solving this when n is sufficiently large? Now we know that when n is, for example, even when n equals to 2, this is a totally unsolved problem and, and I don't think it's going to be solved ever because the, the, the solution when you have local information is going to be possibly infinite dimensional. And, uh, and so uh, what is the answer? The answer to this, when n is sufficiently large, is provided by mean field games. And this is an, this is an important uh, sort of a development of the last decade or so. And, and it started uh, with the word of, and, and it was approached from different angles with different motivations and so on. And, and, and Lyon and, and Lazare in, in France, uh, uh, they were interested from the PDE point of view. And, and wanted to know the, the solutions, existence, uniqueness of solutions which arise in mean field games, not necessarily linking it to Nash, Nash equilibria. And then there were a lot of uh, other results. Peter Keynes uh, developed several results, and we have done several results more from the control point of view. But, uh, but what I want to share with you is, is uh, going back in, in, the, uh, in history, there is an insightful statement on games with a large number of agents. Now, the reason why, uh, if you have only local information, why these problems are extremely difficult uh, is because there is strategic interaction between the players. In other words, what one player does affects what the other player's information is, and then you have to, you have to deduce what this other player had done, even though you don't have access to the information based on which that decision was made. But if you have a very large number of agents, if they enter into the state dynamics in a proper way, then that strategic interaction may not be that important. You may do not have to know exactly what the other players would be doing. You may, it is like you are playing against the cloud, against the population, and, and if you know the distribution of that population, then that will be sufficient and you don't have to know exactly what individual players are doing. So if you, if you go back, this is the, the Bible of, of game theory by uh, von Neumann and Morgenstern, the theory of games and economic uh, behavior, and this is on page 13, 14. Now, they haven't done anything in the book with regard to that, but they have raised the issue. And, and what uh, von Neubin and Morgenstern has said uh, is that when the number of participants becomes really great, they mean large, 
uh, some hope emerges that they knew that strategic interaction with a finite number or a, a sizable number of players is a difficult problem in general. That the influence of every particular participant will become negligible and that the above difficulties may recede and more conventional theory becomes possible. So this, uh, I'm not going to say that this motivated the work by Lazare and Lyons and so on, but, uh, but, but indeed the, the underlying sort of the message here is that if you approach these games which are difficult to solve from the infinite uh, number of players, from the infinite population point of view, things may uh, become uh, simpler. And, and so, so that was the motivation uh, for us, even though we discovered this, uh, this quote uh, at a much later stage. And it says it's a well-known phenomenon in many branches of the exact and physical sciences that very great numbers are often easier to handle than those of medium size. And that turns out to be exactly true for the class of problems where, and this is the, the law of statistic and probabilities can be, can be used. So coming back to the, to the original uh, uh, setting, and now I'm going to decompose the players in such a way that, that uh, each one has its own uh, state dynamics, x sub i. And again, the, the, this is the Wiener process input, and these are some scaling parameters. Theta i is the type of that player. It, it, uh, it signifies what this player is. And there's a very sensitive cost function. I'm going to consider the infinite horizon case. And, uh, and, and note that, the, so you may say, where is the coupling between the players? The coupling between the players, you can also bring in some coupling here, but here to simplify things, I'm uh, introducing a coupling between the players only through the cost functions. So note that this is, a, maybe I should have said j here, j from one to n. So this is the average value of the states of all the players, including the ith one. And then you, is essentially the ith one, you can view this as a consensus problem. The ith player wants its state to be as close to this. In formation problems, for example, this uh, is relevant. And then there is a soft constraint on you. Okay, so, and, uh, and so what we are interested in, and, and for the risk sensitive control, we know that if you expand it in terms of delta, this is the risk sensitivity parameter, then you have the risk neutral cost as the first order term or the zeroth order term, and then the variance of, so you are minimizing a combination of the, uh, the mean value of the cost and the variance of the cost, and there are some higher order terms as well. So, so this is what we call this Fn, is what we call the mean field term, or the mass behavior of the term. So, so if you knew exactly what this one was, then, then, the, then this would be a standard optimal control problem, a robust optimal control problem, because of the risk sensitivity issue. So, so the agents are coupled with each other through the mean field term. Now, if you want the details of this, uh, the complete solution to this, it appears in the transactions on automatic control with a former PhD student of mine in the March issue of this year. So, uh, so again, the, the, you, can, uh, you can also formulate uh, the same uh, problem with the just consistent with what I had on the first two slides. Uh, you can bring in an adversarial input and then instead of the risk sensitivity, you have a risk neutral thing, but this time the adversarial <laughs> input is going to play against the controller. And so therefore you solve a, 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 a zero sum game here for each player. For each player, there's an adversarial component. So the question is what are the, what are the uh, connections between these two? And uh, uh, so the VI, again, as I indicated, can be viewed as a fictitious player or an adversary, which uh, strives for a worst case cost function. So how do we, the question is, how do we obtain the solution to this problem, particularly as n uh, is sufficiently large? Okay, so, so the thing uh, is, the, is the following. So, so again, these are the two problems. Uh, one is P1 is what I call is the exponentiated cost. This is the risk sensitive without the adversarial input. And this one is in its dynamics and adversarial input. So, so this was the average term. So, so the, the approach to this problem is the, is the following. You, you say, let's take a general distribution 
for the, for the mass behavior. And in this case, it's just the expected value of that that you have to uh, use. And, uh, and so, so you, you solve a robust control problem for the player, either according to this uh, criterion or according to this one. So you are given a G of T. We still have to, to compute what G of T, what the optimum G is. And, and, but it's common to all players. And uh, so for this G, you solve this robust control problem. And then that leads to individual state dynamics for each player as a, as a function of G. And, uh, and now you, you look at the average value of that, of all the x, since so this is a function of G. So what that leads to is a, uh, is a, a fixed point equation. So, so for each fixed G, you solve the linear uh, robust control problem, and the solution depends on G. And then you come back and close the loop, and, uh, and, and this gives you a nonlinear operator uh, as a function of G, which relates G to G again. And, and then you solve for a fixed point of this. Once you solve the fixed point, you find the G star. For example, if there's a unique solution, then for this G star, you find the, uh, the corresponding robust control. Okay, so that's the thing. So, so if you follow this, this recipe, then, then for the uh, individual robust control problems for P1 and P2, they are the same. And uh, for each fixed G, and, uh, and is given by this expression. And note that it is, this time, it's not just uh, pure state feedback, but it is uh, like here. Uh, and there is an additional term because, because of this mass behavior uh, uh, that, that, that you are reacting to. So there is an S of t, and, the, and S satisfies a backward equation, which depends on g. Okay, so, uh, and, and S has a unique solution. So if you, if you know what G is, then, then this is a unique state feedback plus some constant bias term. And then again, the Riccati equation appears. This is the algebraic Riccati equation. And then you need under stabilizability and detectability conditions, there is a unique solution for each fixed G. There is a unique solution to this equation. So, so there are, these two robust tracking problems are identical, and, and, and they are related to robust H-infinity control problem with respect to gamma. And then you do the mean field analysis for this. I'll not go into the details. So this is just to show you what the, what the T uh, looks like. And, uh, and, uh, and you, uh, the mean field, you d define a mean field system for P1 and a mean field system for P2. Now, even though these two problems are identical as far as the, as far as the robust control computation goes, the mean field behaviors are not identical, actually. That was kind of surprising to us when we found out. So the equivalence between the risk sensitive optimal control and the, uh, and the zero sum game uh, stops there. Okay, so, uh, so, the, uh, so what uh, is Fn? Fn was the average value of x. You can show using the strong law of large numbers that, that this converges to the expected value of xi, which is t of gt. And then we have to uh, seek g star for problem one, h star for problem two, such that uh, we have the fixed points. And then uh, you can use contraction mapping theorems and obtain a sufficient condition under which uh, a solution exists and is unique. And that also uh, gives you a, a sort of a, because of the contraction mapping theorem, uh, gives you a recursive algorithm to compute G. Okay, and as I said, generally G star is different from A star. But uh, when, when gamma goes to infinity, that is if there is no uh, disturbance, uh, then, the, uh, then the G star will be equal to A star. This is the standard problem. Okay, so, so, we have, we have so, so we had this. And note that one other thing that I want to note is that the solution is uh, here, the solution here is a function of for the ith players. This is a generic player. A generic player's control is a function of only the local information of that player, x sub i. And this is something that can be computed offline. Okay, so, so, it's a, so this is a function of local information as well. So when n is equal to n is infinite or very large, 
then this way we are able to solve this problem, which is unsolved, which is extremely difficult, if not, if not impossible to solve, uh, when n is uh, finite. So the next thing to close the loop, what one has to say is, OK, well, we're, let's say that we have a game with uh, n sufficiently large, but not infinite. And can we use the mean field uh, solution, the solution that is given through the mean field approach, is an approximate solution to the original problem. So what one has to show is that you have an epsilon Nash equilibrium in that case. And, uh, and so that can be shown. There exists an epsilon Nash equilibrium with G star. So you use G star for P1, and then for the other one, you use H star. So, so epsilon Nash equilibrium meaning that uh, you fix all other players at that uh, value. And then you allow u sub i, the i player's control, to depend also on the, on the entire state. And, uh, and still the local information gives you an epsilon optimality. And the, and the epsilon optimality, the, the relationship, the, the order relationship between epsilon and n is that it's like 1 over square root of n. Okay, so, so the important thing is that the, this epsilon Nash strategy is decentralized. That is, it's only a function of x i and g star. And then by the law of large numbers, you can actually show that the g star, which was solved from the uh, fixed point equation, actually approximates this uh, as n goes to infinity, this goes to 0, and, and almost surely, and likewise this one for, for g star. And, uh, and g star, note that is a deterministic function and can be computed online. So, uh, the same results also hold for P2, that is for the worst case. So, so this is the, the general sort of a, uh, a, a structure that, that uh, here is a linear quadratic mean field game uh, without the adversary that is, uh, can be obtained from this one, the P, from P2 as gamma goes to infinity. There is a, only a partial equivalence between the risk sensitive mean field game and the, and the risk sensitive uh, uh, and, the, and the robust mean field game, where you have this, so the R is robust here, Rs is risk sensitive, and there is a, there is a connection between the, the two. And, uh, and, and we can have some large deviation limits and so on, the risk neutral limit as well as this. So there, there is, a, a, now, uh, this uses only the expected value of the, uh, of the average state, or the average state, and, and if you have a much more nonlinear, non-quadratic problem, then you have to use the whole distribution, and, uh, and you have to look for a, it's a, the problem becomes more complicated because you have to look for a fixed point in the, in the class of all distributions on, on X. Okay, so this, uh, I'll stop here. I'm not sure whether this is, I use Google uh, <laughs> translation.